I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay. Today we are talking about Batman Begins, the 2005 film directed by Christopher Nolan, screenplay by Christopher Nolan and David S. Goyer. I'm joined by the Lessons from the Screenplay team, Trisha Aran. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Cayetos. Hi. So this is going to be the first in a series of three podcasts that we're doing on the Dark Knight trilogy, and I'm very excited about it. Also, uh, this month, our patrons are voting amongst the other Nolan filmography for what our patron exclusive episode will be. So patrons, keep an eye out for that. Very excited. It's a, it's a Nolan filled month uh, <laughs> because once upon a time, Tenet might come out this month. <laughs> right. Maybe in another, in an alternate universe it has. Batman Begins is really, really interesting. Revisiting it was uh, a fascinating experience for me because the context is so different. You have to talk mm-hmm. about context when talking about Batman Begins because watching it now and especially, you know, after The Dark Knight has come out, The Dark Knight overshadows Batman Begins in basically every single possible way, mm-hmm. I yeah. feel. And so it's weird going back to Batman Begins and it feels kind of goofy and there are these weird things in it and which is impressive also to realize that The Batman film that came before this one was hyper goofy. Uh And so it's weird that that was that this one was a step down from that goofiness. But then I did kind of shift my brain back to remembering being in the theater in 2005, going to see Mm -hmm. a new Batman film from the director that did that one memento movie and seeing something that I'd never seen before, which is the super serious trying to be hyper real picture of Batman with this incredibly talented cast and just this whole other approach and i remembered how crazy that was and how special that was so it was very fascinating trying to watch this film looking at it from both of those lenses so i'm curious for you guys what what it was like revisiting it uh this time around yeah i i you know i I liked batman forever when i was you know 15 or whatever (laughs) um (laughs) and then batman and robin i was just like what is happening even at that age i was like why i was down well, so when you down. when you were a child, I was a young <laughs> right. man, so you know I was like, uh, <laughs> no, but um, but I I was a big fan of Memento, and I enjoyed Insomnia, and I had seen Christian Bale in Equilibrium and American Psycho, mm-hmm. so I was like, okay, I kind of get where these two things coming together is going to, is, is, what that's going to result in, you know. So yeah, I really enjoyed it, and uh, there there are definitely some goofy things, you know, the tank chase and just some of the some of the more Batman-y kinds of things that are happening. And when you are used to the Dark Knight, you go back and watch this and you're like, okay. Mm-hmm. But yeah, especially in 2005, I was just very happy for there to be a Batman movie that felt like what I wanted a Batman movie to be. Yeah, I mean, same for me. I think it was it was a real thrill to see it in theaters. And because I, I wasn't overly attached to the Batman franchise. I hadn't even seen all of the Tim Burton Batmans at that point. I mm-hmm. I, I think I'd seen like Batman and Robin. <laughs> it was like <laughs> my main first like Batman memory, like George Clooney. Joel so, Schumacher. Yeah. 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 So I didn't have like a deep uh, connection to the franchise. And this film was really exciting because it had that awesome Hans Zimmer, James Newton Howard score. Yeah. That was really mm. like cool. And I think I think the last samurai had come out recently or maybe a couple of years before, which also had like an epic Hans Zimmer score. And it kind of reminded me of that. And it this even had like katana sword fighting. I think there was like mm-hmm. a there was a moment with like <laughs> we're going to do like Asian sword fighting in all, all the right. movies. Um, so it, it hit a lot of my sweet spots and it made me a Batman fan because I, I kind of for me, it sold me on this is a really interesting character with a really interesting origin story. and the themes that the movie was very overtly grappling with were interesting. Yeah. So I, I just, I found it to be like way beyond what I had expected from like a Batman movie. And I, I was excited about it too, because I had seen Memento and it was like, Oh wow. They're letting this guy make a superhero movie. What does that mean? Uh, right. So yeah, I, I walked out of the theater kind of thrilled because it ends with that, like cut to black, you know, cut to yeah. the title with the Hans Zimmer music. And you're just like, Oh yeah, I'm pumped. Mm. Uh, that's my memory of it it's interesting to think back to a world where there weren't a lot of superhero movies mm-hmm. like, right well, especially the mid early 2000s where it was all like garbage like yes. other words. <laughs> right. yeah. no exactly like they they did make a couple but they were more in the style of the 90s 
Batman's like eighties and nineties, those mm. Batman movies that were, were inherently sort of goofy. And the interesting thing that I think is really smart about, I mean, there's so much that's smart about Nolan's approach to the way that he like rebooted this franchise and like approached the character, but Batman as a character going back, you know, obviously to the comic books is not super in the way that basically all of the other DC comic book heroes are. Mm -hmm. Like, he's not Superman. He's not Wonder Woman. Like, he he has a lot of money. And then <laughs> in, right. that's his main power. Um, and then in this movie, he, he gets a lot of skills, right? But he is not a super character. And so starting... You know, and he's not Spider-Man, which Spider-Man had already come out. The, like... Um, One and two, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Those... Right. those films were out but again that's a totally different kind of a superhero deciding that batman should be grounded <clears throat> batman should be grounded because obviously of all the superheroes that there are batman should be grounded was of course it seems really fundamental now um but at the time was really really cool also that we'd never seen the character's origin story in a movie before and then there aren't superheroes in the world of Batman, like in the world of the, the Nolan trilogy, there aren't other superheroes. So like when he's explaining to Alfred that he's going to become a symbol, they're like a symbol. Interesting. Right. What does that mean? <laughs> right. And he's like, and so you're not going to tell anyone your true identity. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> I see. Okay. And they're just kind of like explaining what a superhero is to you, which of course now plays like sort of goofy because we're so steeped and oversaturated in superheroes. Everything about it is just really, really smart because it's cutting through the noise. Um, there wasn't a ton of noise, but it's cutting through the the legacy, the noise of the legacy, which is like all of these like super comic booky, goofy, goofy things. Mm -hmm. So much so that like I thought that every supporting character was surely from the comic books. Mm. And like I, so I was so confused when I first went and saw this movie because I was like, Rachel Dawes, I don't remember her. Who's she? She's mm. probably from the comic books. I should read the comic books. And even like Raja Ghoul, he is from the comic books, but he's not, you know, one of the like huge, you know, huge right. penguin y Joe Curry. Right. Those kinds of Batman villains. So um it's like really really uh, it's just great yeah well the the thing that also excited me about this movie was that my batman growing up was the animated series mm. right yeah which uh with kevin conroy as batman and mark hamill as the joker and so that's what i saw a lot of so for me seeing ra's al ghul and scarecrow and seeing gary oldman deliver kind of a similar jim gordon as the as the show mm. that all made me happy because i was like oh this is more my childhood even though again like i did watch the earlier batman movies the burtons and the schumachers but it felt like that was the batman that i spent more time with as a kid weirdly the batman arkham games that came out over the past decade brought back the creator of that show and kevin conroy and mark hamill and like a lot of the cast and stuff and actually sort of turned that show into this next level series of video game stories so that was really cool too but but i think that that's what felt good to me about batman begins was that it wasn't here are the same four villains you know exactly especially when you're sort of doing a reboot it's not just here are the villains you've seen every single time we're gonna do something different and for me that different was something familiar to me but in more of a niche way than to the public maybe you know so i felt like it was like oh cool it's it's my thing now yeah yeah, it's interesting because I think Batman was maybe the you know superhero I was most familiar with mm -hmm. because for some reason as a kid, I think we had Batman the movie, the 1966 mm -hmm. one with Adam West uh -huh. like on, on VHS and I loved it. I would watch it over and over again and when I see clips of it, I have visceral memories because the villain's plan is he dehydrates people into like powdered dust that kind of looked like candy <laughs> that made me want to eat it as a kid and then the, the, the finale is this like really tense scene where they're like rehydrating like the UN members or whatever right. <laughs> anyway it's it's and, and, and like the, the way the, the Batman figures out who's involved is he's like he's like the shark was pulling my leg the Joker right. must be involved like it's like this what? the weirdest <laughs> it's it's a Just trip I camp love at it's movie. most beautiful yeah <laughs> yeah uh, we should have started with that one. Honestly. Uh, 
And then I didn't really watch the animated series at all, but Captain Christian, one of his first videos, video essays that he did was on Batman Evolving the Legend and talking about that animated series, which Mm. I really didn't know that much about. And watching that video made me really appreciate it. So I recommend checking that out. Also, real quick, the score of the animated series, the theme makes its way into Hans Zimmer's score, at least in Dark Knight Rises. I don't know if it's all three movies or not, but I just remember listening to Dark Knight Rises soundtrack one point and being like, (gasps) Oh my gosh. So sorry, Michael, you're saying that's a, that's a cool nod. I yeah, yeah that. that's really cool. And I loved the Tim Burton films, and I even managed to love, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger, George Clooney ones. Like that was fun for me as a child. So I actually had some like resistance initially the first time mm. I watched this film because mm. it was so different than every other Batman. And obviously that is the point. But it was weird for me. How old was I? So 2005. How old am I? 11. <laughs> am I 11? Is that all? No. I'm 19. To me, you no, were, yeah. That was like after high school, beginning of college. Okay, right. Yeah. So I was old enough to, yeah, a- appreciate it. But also I had these fond memories of like, Batman, fun. He's going to put on the suit. He's going to like fight Nipples. crime and it's going to be, yeah. Right. <laughs> and instead, the first 20 minutes is like, it's a scene from the prestige also randomly yeah. where Christian Bale is in this weird foreign prison for some yeah. reason yes. and you don't know what's going on or why he's there. And then there's no. a flashback to explain the fo- like, it's so Christopher Nolan and all that. Yep. And it's, it was very disorienting uh, for me. And it's not until the midpoint that like he becomes Batman. Right. And that was odd. It's an origin story. This, well, this is exactly Michael's issue with Casino Royale, the other gritty reboot from the mid aughts, right. which was it's not stupid like the Bond or Batman that I'm used to. <laughs> How dare they make a real movie? <laughs> I'm really with you, though, Michael, because I didn't like this movie the first time I saw it. And part of the reason why is it, it didn't meet my expectations, but also it's just it's this really layered and slowly paced thing in the first act. It's yeah. boring. Like I don't know. It's not actually boring. There's a lot of ninjas and a lot of glaciers. <laughs> it's really beautiful. A lot of glaciers. <laughs> and, you know, it isn't this Batman in Gotham urban story. And they actually did a good job of, like, in the first, I don't know, 20 minutes, investing me in the Bruce and Rachel, like, plot line, the, the romantic interest. And then they just stop that for 45 <laughs> minutes while he goes and fights ninjas. It is disorienting. It's got several layers of time shifts to it. It's basically like a almost one hour long training sequence. Very, very elaborate training sequence. And in a way that I think ultimately holds the movie together thematically. Because without that whole big chunk, the movie's not about anything. And Bruce's journey is not about anything. But when you're right. in it, and the movie starts, you have no idea what the movie is going to be. It doesn't mm-hmm. do a great job of taking, you know, we've talked about this before, like in a, in a first act, you almost want to like take the audience to all the places you'll kind of eventually go or like hint at where you're eventually going. Kind of the movie doesn't really do that at all. It just sort of strands you in Nepal for a while mm-hmm. and, or, or wherever he is and, and kind of leaves you going, where is this Headed. And it's interesting because I, I do think, like you were saying, it yeah that is what makes this movie unique and what get, motivates this whole new Nolan trilogy exactly. is that it, it takes the time to ground itself. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking while watching it, does this movie work if I don't know that it's a Batman movie? And I feel like it kind of is is trying to do both at the same yeah. time where it's trying if to... If you're just watching a character like wander through... Right, yeah, where like... You, you like it kind of works as that, but also I think it it relies on you knowing at some point there's going to be Batman happening <laughs> for you to like go along with it. And so I think that's just kind of where there's this uh, interesting like almost disconnect or just a, a meta murkiness kind of mm-hmm. of what it thinks the audience is is bringing or expecting with it. That's exactly what you can do if your film is called Batman Begins use that to your advantage like we know batman is coming let's do something special here where it's like the first half of the film there's no batman it's about this person named bruce wayne right who's gone on this crazy journey to kind of like face his fears and transform himself i, I was so down with the like memento structure at the beginning uh-huh. you, you get some audience patience for free mm-hmm. which it just is what it is like i'm not critiquing it i'm just saying there's 
a screenwriting thing in there where like, and, and, and there are many ways to get patience or like to get stuff for free from your audience. But, you know, one of those is like really leaning into genre convention, like, or if, if you're writing in a genre, for example. So you, you can kind of like gain ground with your audience in a number of ways by using like cinematic shorthand. But there's a meta thing that's happening here that you're talking about, Michael, where you get some stuff for free from your audience that you don't get if this movie isn't Batman. Yeah, I, I have a friend who strongly believes, I don't know if he feels this way now, like that the MCU exists, which he's a fan of, but he always used to say that a movie should exist in and of itself. Like a movie should be able to stand alone. So for him, he got really annoyed at the end of Red Dragon when someone comes in and says, oh, there's an FBI agent here. I'll tell her, you know, you're not interested or whatever. And he turns and says, what is her name? And it's like credits, you know, (laughs) and then Batman Begins does the exact same thing with the like he left his calling card. It's a joker credits. Um, And his argument was always like, that doesn't mean anything in this movie right it means something in the meta um and i don't think there's a there's a right answer to that question but i think that different people are going to have different expectations of if you are going into a batman movie or an mcu movie or whatever star wars star wars yes thank you (laughs) like you're expected to have a certain knowledge going in but should those movies strive to to stand alone or not, you know, and it's different when it's a direct sequel, but it's a, but it's not when it's a reboot, like Batman mm-hmm. begins is the first movie in its own thing. So, you know, Hey, there's a calling card doesn't mean anything to somebody just watching Batman begins. Just like the first hour may not be interesting to people who don't know that Batman is coming. I, I think that you absolutely are always making any art with reference to a society that people are aware of and in conversation Mm -hmm. with and that kind of thing. But I do think it's an interesting argument that movies shouldn't rely too heavily on that. I I agree that it is just kind of an interesting space to be working in. And I think overall, the film does balance that in an interesting way. It did kind of leave me with this weird feeling at the end of it where I was like, I really enjoyed this and this is cool, but I don't feel like I got what I like came in for like Mm. i don't feel like i got the batman movie that i wanted when i sat down but it did brilliantly set up the dark knight which we will talk about in the next episode where Mm. you you get everything and more that you want (laughs) well i feel like in some ways like the title batman begins like the fact that it says like begins at the end like when it cuts to black that's where the title comes on it's like it's kind of like now it's gonna begin because like we basically spent a whole movie just getting him to be the first act of the trilogy yeah it's like getting him to be fully batman and like now gordon is like gonna be his main contact and now there's yeah joker calling card and like now the actual batman you all know and love can maybe start but we took a whole movie two and a half hours whatnot to get just to here Mm -hmm. (laughs) so if you were hoping to get beyond the begins it I, i had the same feeling where it's kind of like wow this really was just all set up almost this whole movie. Yeah. Your friend's argument is interesting, like in the abstract, but of course doesn't mean anything on the ground because right. there is no universe in which no one has seen a movie. Right. Like, so right, 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 right. <laughs> every movie is in conversation with like what movies are these days. Film and, right. history mm-hmm. and yeah. like everything. And that's what I was saying about getting stuff for free from the audience and like leaning into genre convention or like using cinematic shorthand or visual shorthand for something, even, you know, apart from like a piece of IP, all of that stuff is a good thing. Ultimately, like, understanding that your audience is smart they've seen a movie before so you Mm -hmm. can like skip around with some stuff you can utilize the different tools of filmmaking because your audience has a working knowledge of what movies are it's ultimately a good thing i think it just goes back to when you are dealing with uh something like this that is part of an existing or like um utilizing a piece of of intellectual property that has a huge presence in the culture then It becomes just how much, how much do you use it? And that's why I was talking about the disorientation here. It's really interesting because they're, they're trading on, Hey, this is a Batman movie. You love Batman. You're going to like this movie. Go with us through this first, very, very meandering first huge chunk of it, because we're going to give you what you want. So they're utilizing that. But at the same time, they're throwing curveballs at us with characters we're not familiar with. And the league of shadows, which is also like, 
Ra's al Ghul is from the comics. The League of Shadows is not. Mm-hmm. And everyone is like, the who? The what now? Their whole plans to destroy Gotham? That's a weird mission for a ninja organization. <laughs> so wait, so that that whole like, m- you know, like ancient organization that brought down Rome, none of that's in any of the comics? Not as far as I could tell in my research. I if, oh, so, if I am wrong, I looked into it because I was like, they seem very concerned with destroying civilizations, especially Gotham. Very much Gotham all the time. Yeah, the way he talks about Gotham in this film, it almost sounds like it's like the New York City of this world. Or of like, of course it is. It's like it's like mm-hmm. the yeah, it, it's the it's like the city of its time, and so it would be the Rome equivalent, uh, which was interesting. So I was because I know they shoot so much of it in Chicago, the new <laughs> the new series. I'm like, no, it's not New York; it's Chicago. Yeah, yeah, until it's Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I just think it's really interesting. Like, how much of that do you use? Right, you have existing IP. Your audience is relatively familiar with it. How much of it do you use? Yeah. There are very few people in the world who can say that Meryl Streep played them in a movie. I, unfortunately, am not one of those people, though I'm holding out hope. She could do it. You know, she could. Susan Arlene, however, is one of those people. If that name sounds familiar, it's because besides being a staff writer at The New Yorker, Susan Arlene is the author of eight books, one of them being The Orchid Thief, which the movie adaptation, screenplay by Charlie Kaufman, was based on. Susan Arlene has created a class called Creative Nonfiction, Write Truth with Style, and you can check it out today on Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. With thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, freelancing, writing, and more. If you're as interested as I am in learning about the creative process of other writers, then I think you will really enjoy Susan's class. And it's just one of the thousands of classes available on Skillshare. And if you use our link, skillshare.com slash beyond the screenplay, you get two free months of premium membership. Once again, that's skillshare.com slash beyond the screenplay. Or click on the link in the show notes. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring Beyond the Screenplay. I was watching the um, behind the scenes making up stuff on the Blu-ray and they do talk about Ra's al Ghul being from the comics and they don't talk about exactly what his plan was, but that in the comics, he is a much bigger picture thinker than someone like the Joker or mm. right. Yeah. Like that kind of a He's thing. He's basically Thanos. That's his whole plan is destroy huge chunks of the population to save the world from ecological disaster. Right. So yeah, so that's interesting. And then another thing that, I thought was interesting is that there was an uh they used a clip from an interview with Paul Levitz, who is was the president and publisher of DC Comics, maybe still is, I don't know. But he was talking about origin stories. And I realized that the idea of an origin story has kind of become, you know, just kind of for granted. Or someone says, Oh yeah, it's a new movie, it's an origin story for this character, and now we have a ton of examples of that. Right. But this was, I I feel like this did kind of set the bar for that. And he was saying, you know, the magic of origin story is that it provides us with the most fundamental moment of connection with the character. Mm. And I think the the strongest origin stories obviously do that really well. And I think this film, as you were saying early on, I think, Alex, that this this, this movie has a theme and it really wants you to know that its theme (laughs) is fear. Fear. It's about fear. Every other word... (laughs) And yeah. the first act is fear, <laughs> but it but it does do obviously I guess that that work of providing a a more clear motivation for why someone might become Batman, and mm-hmm. I think that is kind of the crowning achievement of it because that's definitely absent, I think, in all the previous Batman movies. Absolutely. When I think looking at the Dark Knight, uh, it feels like actually I don't really think about Christian Bale very much in that movie. Like it's all about the joker and the almost is like the the twists and turns of the story and the maniacal plot and i don't really think about the actual character of bruce wayne that much but batman begins it's it's all about bruce wayne yeah. and it really is a deep dive like character study of this kind of iconic figure so it, it's fun to revisit batman begins and remember that it was like oh at one point this series like was really about christian bale and really about Mm-hmm. this character because it doesn't feel so much that way especially in the dark knight and it's it's it, that was interesting to revisit because i think when i think about the dark knight trilogy i actually don't really think about christian bale that much weirdly even though he's 
Batman. All right. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I think about everything else about the trilogy, about Christopher Nolan's direction, about the style, the look, the villains. And Batman Begins is is because maybe it's the least watched out of them. It's it's good to remember that like there is a part of this trilogy that is all about Bruce Wayne, and mm. that's really the cent- the center of the story. Well, the movie takes a lot of care, both when they're on screen, which isn't for very long, but but just throughout the film, to really talk about Bruce's family and their legacy and who they are and what they believe in, like what their value system is. Um, I really love the seed. It's, you know, it's doing exposition as hard as it can. But I really, really love the scene where they're on their way to the opera and they're riding in the public transit system, which is like really smart character design to make the Waynes, who are incredibly wealthy, is to make uh, Thomas Wayne not at all care about his money. Um, <laughs> he's a doctor. Yeah. He, right, I right. love it. Bruce is like, Dad, do you work in that building in like, you know, Wayne Tower or whatever, Wayne Enterprises? And he's like, no, I work at the hospital, son. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. I help people. I am I, the best billionaire people. you've ever met. And he's like, better men run that company. Better men? Well, men who are more interested in it. It's like, <laughs> but but it is smart character design because the biggest problem with Bruce has always been that he has money. And, and um, not just in this sort of like more aware sort of class moment that we're in right now, but it's always been a problem with the character because Batman is there to help the people. And how can he help the people when he has all of the money. And so it's a really smart reworking of Thomas Wayne as a character, just approach to Thomas Wayne as a character. And then to spend a decent amount of time throughout the rest of the movie, reminding us that his legacy is about helping the people of Gotham. Like Fox tells him, yeah, he almost bankrupted the company trying to like bail Gotham out of the depression. And then Ra's al Ghul is like, your dad was a big problem for us. Your family was a big problem for us when we were trying, when we were using the depression to- yeah. This time we tried a new tactic. <laughs> Economics. <laughs> yeah. It's like, how do you, how do you do that? <laughs> It's silly. Every listen, everything about the League of Shadows is silly, but everything about the design of the Waynes helps explain the character of Bruce. And it's very, very smart because not only does it make him relatable, it makes him Batman. When even if it's silly and doesn't make sense, like the movie is very thematically unified. Like exactly. everything comes back to this idea of I mean, there's there's the core like you know, facing your fear, you know, kind of becoming your fear to overcome it with Bruce Wayne, but then in the bigger kind of socioeconomic mm-hmm. uh, Thanos kind of discussion, right? everything ties back to that as well. Even exactly the, the Wayne family legacy is part of that bigger Thanos style story about, should we just burn it all down or try to save it? Mm-hmm. And, and Batman comes down on the side of let's try to save it as opposed to driving everybody crazy with hallucinogenic flower dust. <laughs> Yes. Now, <laughs> <laughs> listen, David Escoyer has had some bad trips, I think. <laughs> just, just like, there is so many bad trips in this movie. <laughs> I was watching the scene where he has to fight the ninjas while he's super high. And I was right. like, this is the worst. <laughs> is, I want to continue what you were saying, Alex. But also, if you had a microwave emitter that would vaporize all of the water in the city... Would it not vaporize all the water in human bodies? It absolutely would. Yes. Like, <laughs> it's, it's very nice of them to selectively <laughs> somehow engineer. Only in pipes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that is what's weird about it is that once once it gets going, I think my favorite part of this film is there's there's the handoff between the first part of Bruce Wayne wandering aimlessly and learning how to do stuff. And then he's back. And now we're seeing him become Batman. And that's fun when it's like it's I'm really fun discover this yeah. cave and what's this crazy car i think this is going to be the new batmobile everybody like that whole section is really really fun mm-hmm. and then once he's there it kind of goes goofy again yeah. or in, in, the, in this more almost like classic batman goofy yep. way mm. and and i think that is what's just the the unevenness of the film kind of expresses itself there and, and even visually you know the narrows which never shows up ever again uh, in the nope. trilogy and it's this like weird CGI slash miniature maybe yeah. model that sits in the middle of this. It, it's just weird how it transitions to to that goofy mode. But my favorite part is is 
during that handoff because it's you're kind of getting the best of both worlds and i feel like that is the zone that then the dark knight exists in completely yes Yes. right yeah yeah it's it's interesting you know you mentioned like the the chemical thing where it's like you have this trilogy where they said no magic because even if batman Mm. is a character without superpowers batman villains tend to be you know depending on the comic depending on the show whatever they did a fairly good job with the six villains across this trilogy saying that they also don't have superpowers there is no magic in this world Mm -hmm. but then you do get here's a chemical that makes you see your worst fears and here's a guy who's huge and can break your back and here's you know someone whose face got burned off in just the right way you know (laughs) um and uh, so so, i mean i think that like they definitely still i would say like it's not as bad as the iron man trilogy which just gets less and less makes less and less of an attempt as it goes on to try to sell that everything is science and it's just like by Mm -hmm. iron man 3 Mm -hmm. you're like "Eh, it's just magic yeah right but iron man also exists in the avengers universe so whatever which is Um, full of magic exactly yeah (laughs) but uh, magic entirely (laughs) yeah (laughs) but that is the interesting thing about batman is that if you're not like you're either living in poison ivy can talk to all of her plants world or you're mm. living in the bad guy's just a ninja who has like a weird beard and is really upset about <laughs> things like... <laughs> exactly. also, also why did all the ninjas have like why did they pack their house with explosives was a thought i was having <laughs> yeah as, as the whole thing was expl- anyway <laughs> One thing I do really like about the design of Ducard, quote unquote, uh, mm-hmm. Liam Neeson and Ken Watanabe's Ra's al Ghul is that because I was a fan of the animated series, I knew what Ra's al Ghul looked like. So I knew to mm. expect that goatee and stuff. And they were able to sell it just by saying, like, these are how these people look. So mm-hmm. you are able to sell that idea of like, this is actually Ra's al Ghul. This is just Ducard, who's kind of his henchman. And then twist so like even for like batman fans it's like oh okay we'll buy that he's raz al ghul for now until it's like no the bigger actor in this movie is actually the real villain that's, that's what i was Ra's gonna say right, right like liam neeson doesn't just casually leave a movie right at minute 40 <laughs> oh he does liam neeson's i mean I, we talked about this in like every movie in the mid aughts liam neeson was the like uh the mentor who then dies and, but and if the... he dies then that's sure. fine but right when... right he lives. And well, you but just... also, oh, no. Ra's al Ghul can come back to life as That's per true. the animated series. So That's true. Which is why it was really cool. They put him in Dark Knight Rises as a, is he actually back? No, he's just a figment. Anyway, we'll get, we'll get into that later. I do remember when I first saw the film, like, I was genuinely surprised. Like, I did not expect Liam Neeson to come back. I thought it was just like, you know, Bruce Wayne's showing he's a better person than these people by saving his mentor. Right. And I and I, I really wasn't hooked into the fact that this was going to be ultimately a Ra's al Ghul like, mm-hmm. villain film. I really was on board with like, oh, it's Scarecrow and he's doing weird drug stuff, I guess. That was a genuinely good twist for me when I first saw it in theaters. And it, it was a, I was confused because there was like, here's like a decoy Asian man and like, the old lady who's going to bring you to him. Oh, never, the actual like, reveal. Yeah, never turn to go away now to the rest of the party. I'm here, Liam Neeson. <laughs> like, that was just kind of a funny uh, theatric. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely like, a lot of like, yeah. we are definitely tricking you right now. Theatricality <laughs> and deception are yeah. right. useful tools. You guys said that it, a bit <laughs> literally, didn't you, Mr. Wayne? <laughs> yeah, so to see. Says, so to see. Says Liam Neeson's or Qui-Gon. I like to call him both while watching these movies. Why would why would anyone want to call him Qui Gon? Why would you, of all awesome. the of all the things Liam Neeson has done though that you could be reminded of? I like Qui Gon. Uh, yeah, I like Qui Gon. But Qui Gon reminds me of the movie that Qui Gon's in. <laughs> One thing I really like about that confrontation when the when Liam Neeson's Ra's al Ghul eventually you know reveals himself at that party is mm-hmm. I really like the setting of the room is completely full of people so they can't just start punching each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen it before in movies, but it's really effective in that scene where there's this sense of politeness and decorum and it it kind of allows, like, there's nothing worse than a monologuing villain when the hero definitely could punch him in the face. (laughs) Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Or leave. Uh, Right. Yeah. (laughs) Or just leave. Yeah, exactly. Escape very quickly and easily. Um, So I really like that. And I like the way that they eventually empty Wayne Manor 
which is Bruce's drunken like mm-hmm. insult tirade, quote unquote drunken insulting tirade against all of the guests. I actually think one of this movie's one of the things that this movie does super well is show us both the persona of Bruce Wayne yep. and the Batman yes. version of Bruce Wayne. And for that reason, Christian Bale is perfect. Yeah. Because American Psycho. Him, like yes. he was giving me such American Psycho vibes during some yeah. of those Bruce oh, Wayne yeah. like right. impersonation monologues. When you yeah. see like the young version of him when he comes back for Chill's uh trial or like hearing or whatever. And he's supposedly back from Princeton, but he got kicked out. But he's got that like Ivy League schoolboy haircut. Right. <laughs> and he's wearing his like dockers and his sweater. I buy it. Like yeah. he has that that polish. He carries himself with the air of wealth. The Christian Bale guano eating grin. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 You're welcome, Brian. the world. <laughs> um, Yikes. <laughs> But but he is re- like some of my favorite scenes are the ones where he's playing Bruce Wayne. Yeah, he's really mm-hmm. really great at those scenes. Yeah, and and there's no better moment for it than that. You know when he like tosses all of his guests out of his birthday party. He has to be believable, and he really is. I really mm. like all of that. And there are stakes because of the, the family legacy. Exactly. Right. Yeah, I, I think every movie in the trilogy has Christian Bale being dick bruce wayne in order to achieve something that you know batman needs like a room cleared or he needs like um i I remember i remember there's the scene where he shows up with the two women uh Mm -hmm. out of the car you know and then dark knight as soon as the helicopter lands i'm like it's gonna be three it's gonna be three yep there it is (laughs) yep yep oh they're just swimming in the fountain it's fine also speaking of christian bale the machinist was six months before it's wild it's like I feel like his like, poor body. Yeah. yeah. And he like he looks great in this movie. Like he doesn't yeah. look like uh-huh. super weathered yet, but I feel like by the Dark Knight Rises, he'd done like five more extreme body transformations. So, right. <laughs> like, he still kind of looks like baby faced and like fresh in Batman mm-hmm. Begins. By Dark Knight Rises, like Christian Bale, like take care of yourself, please. <laughs> well, and it's one of the it's one of the wonderful things about him as an actor is just the complete dedication. You know, to and every single role that he takes, whether it's this or newsies, he's yeah. there for it, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Something that this film also does that's interesting and that is kind of a superhero film problem is like how many how many villains can you stick in a movie? Mm-hmm. Right. And mm. I feel like this this one just barely navigates it and the Dark Knight spent has more time to play with so i think does it fine but there is a little bit of like so we're gonna do scarecrow but we're also <laughs> raza ghoul but Falcone? tom wilkinson yeah right oh, yeah. sure like, yeah it was like a cute mob boss that's there and like <laughs> he's adorable so, like a button-nosed yeah, just, mob boss <laughs> i just i know tom wilkinson's like the cutest mob boss just yeah. like grab his cheek and pinch it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You can always fear what you don't understand. Oh, Tom. Um, <laughs> what the hell are you? <laughs> but I feel like where it kind of falls apart and ultimately doesn't matter, but when you finally see Scarecrow and he's on the horse, uh-huh. he has the mask and it's like the glowing eyes and it just feels like a lot of work was done to get to like that shot. So it's like, look, we did Scarecrow. I guess he took a police horse, maybe, but wasn't he already sprayed with the stuff to be crazy? So he's right. like, well, and like sometimes right. when they're really afraid, they run and they cower, but sometimes they become like zombies and like there was a literal like zombie slowly. scenes where they were like, whoa, like all grabbing <laughs> somebody. <laughs> it's Killian Murphy. What are you going to do? <laughs> and he's great. He's great as Scarecrow. It was just interesting watching that whole thing happen of like, oh, Scarecrow's here, and then like taser and goodbye. Yeah, <laughs> right. I was I was actually surprised how little Scarecrow was in this movie like i was i was waiting for more of him when i rewatched it and i was like oh he's actually not mm-hmm. in the movie a ton and i think that's how they kind of balance it um but i do appreciate that killing murphy was is the only villain who's in all three movies he has like a cameo in the next two movies <laughs> right. i do love that but yeah he actually tested for bruce um because mm-hmm. you know speaking of killing murphy and zombies nolan had seen 28 days later and was like oh i like this guy and then he showed up and tested for bruce and he was like he gave such a good screen test but Christian Bale was kind of our first choice. So I gave him Scarecrow. And then it's sort of like, oh, it makes sense that they're like, let's bring let's bring him back for the next two movies. This episode of Beyond the Screenplay is sponsored by Mubi, the curated streaming service that premieres a new film every day. 
We recently premiered a new video using Pirates of the Caribbean to identify the elements of the adventure genre. While working on the video, we looked back at film history to find some films that inspired not only the adventure genre, but science fiction and horror as well. There are three examples that I want to recommend. For a fun early take on adventure, you can check out the 1939 version of The Man in the Iron Mask. It has some pretty creative visual effects I found equally fascinating and amusing. For some classic expressionist horror, there's the 1922 vampire silent film Nosferatu. And for science fiction, there is, of course, Fritz Lang's 1927 masterpiece Metropolis, one of the most iconic films ever made. If you want to check these films out to do some genre research, all three of them are available on MUBI. Each film on MUBI is hand-picked, there's no algorithm, and it's an amazingly eclectic selection of films from all over the world and from every time period, from old classics to new releases. So if ever you wanted to step out of your particular bubble of film knowledge, MUBI is the perfect place to get started. And you can do so today by heading to MUBI.com slash beyond the screenplay to get 30 days for free. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash beyond the screenplay. Thanks to MUBI for sponsoring Beyond the Screenplay. Yeah, I think it's an interesting, that question that you just asked, Michael, how many villains can you stick in a movie? I think that unfortunately, one of the burdens of the Batman franchise is having so many great villains to choose from. Like mm. Batman has so many great villains to choose from. And also because they are, as we just talked about, not magical for the most part, like Batman fights crime. So they're criminals. They're usually not like, it's not universe ending stakes, right? They're, they're here on the streets of Gotham. And like, if you look at back at um, like the animated series and like some of the orig other um, original versions of the character, it, the plan always has something to do with like money or power, or it's just crime, not in like this grand scheme kind of way, typically, even if there is a grand scheme. And so I think that unfortunately, you have all these great villains, you have so many of them, their plans are often so similar to each other, mm -hmm. because they're all <laughs> just doing crime, which is why you have the existence of something like in many of the I don't know, I used to watch, I, I didn't watch the original, I didn't watch the Batman animated series that you're talking about, Brian. But I did watch all of the Justice League cartoons that were mm. on in like the late 90s that are awesome, by the way. And you have all the villains teaming up all the time. Mm, like that's kind mm. of what they end up doing is because you have so many great villains. They're very theatrical and fun to watch and fun for actors to play and fun to put in your movie or in your show. And it's so you want- the wanna... best part of Batman, the, the, the 1966 one. Uh -huh. yeah. You just want to stick them all in there. And I get that impulse. But then unfortunately, from a story point of view, you then have to tie their plans all together somehow. Right, and right. If, and if we don't see them all working together from the beginning, then they, those have to be reveals. And then you're stuck with three or four of those reveals where it's right. like, actually, Falcone is in the pocket of... So Joe Chill is the original villain. He's in the pocket <laughs> of Falcone. Right. Falcone is then with the Scarecrow. The Scarecrow is then with Ra's al Ghul, but right, not right. the original Ra's al Ghul. It's a different Ra's al Ghul. There you go, everybody. It's tied together. <laughs> um, and it does get exhausting. I think yeah. what's great about the Dark, the Dark Knight, which we're going to talk about, is we know who the big bad is from the job. Right, right. This mm. is the big bad. And there turns out to be like Two-Face... Um, is there another one in the Dark Knight? Mm -mm. I don't think there is. So, and and then they they do they do manage to get Two Face in there, but it's not a reveal because it's a great turning point for that character. But there's one big bad, right? I think that actually is good about the Dark Knight Rises too. They do a lot of that work with Bane, but then they also do the reveals where it's not the, okay. We'll get well, to that. Yeah, yeah. Dark Knight Rises is interesting <laughs> because there's there's one and two half villains. There's the villain who then <laughs> yeah, right. ends up not being, and then there's the not who ends up being. We'll get into that. But uh, yeah, and, and like Dark Knight also has um, Eric Roberts' uh, character. But like, there's a difference mm, yeah, between yeah. sort of All like right. superhero villain and like bad guy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is like why I don't think of Falcone as like a villain in Batman Begins the way that I think of the other two. But the interesting thing is that the one rule that the studio put on Nolan was every movie has to have you know for toy purposes 
Every movie oh. has to have two villains, which of course translates to two costumed villains, right. two toys, right. you know, um, a new vehicle and a new suit. So you, you know, conveniently have Batman being like, I need to turn my head. I need to, you know, dogs bit me and like all that kind of but stuff. He does need to turn his head. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I think it's, I think it's beautifully done, but I think that is part of why right. you end up having to to put multiple villains in your movie is because there is an expectation of like, yeah, this is a dark gritty reboot trilogy, but this is also, also a superhero, toys. also yeah. toys, mm-hmm. also merchandise, merchandise, all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's also, you know, there, there are those weird out of step quip, goofy joke moments that feel like literally it was like a, a, a note page yeah. from the studio just inserted where the cop is like, on, they're chasing the Batmobile, and he's like, "What does it look like?" Zero. <laughs> Never mind. Like, yeah, and like, yeah. Like, all three of the films like have those moments, uh, right? Where mm. It's like you got to have like a like a bystander like see a thing go by and like say like, "I got to get me one of those." You know? Yeah, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> right. Like, nice coat. Yeah. Like, yeah. What? Yeah, that's the. Oh, I like. God. I love that nice coat line because it's right after he says it. That's when he. The homeless guy he gave his coat to, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Um, immediately afterwards, he just goes vertically up into the yeah. air, and there's no indication of like what mechanism is allowing him to just rise right. vertically. Where does he get these wonderful toys? <laughs> the, and the Dark Knight sometimes hair. rises. Um, <laughs> oh, it's also <laughs> uh, no. The last thing I was going to say about Scarecrow's the reason I think he also works so well in this is that he he's used as for the Rachel subplot. Mm-hmm. primarily like he's kind of her antagonist and right. the force right. that she's fighting the whole time it, it kind of avoids that you know the double costumed person that you're going to be facing at some point feel and mm. and i do think that once again this movie does stick to its theme like his whole thing with like <laughs> right. making people afraid with his psychotropic drugs like is very on theme so it's impressive yeah. even if it doesn't all makes sense all the time it's impressive their dedication to this is all going to be of a piece mm. yeah well and you get the sense too and, and part of this is just killian murphy's performance he really is wonderful in this yeah um but you get the sense too that that scarecrow and this is why i think we like bringing him back he's kind of lovable because he's not because he isn't the big bad and because he doesn't have the like kind of he's part of the big plan, but his interest in like human psychology makes him more dimensional. It gives him a little bit more interest as a character where um, he's working for this mob boss and helping get his guys transferred into Arkham. And he does ultimately, you know, dump the the drugs into the water supply. But you get the feeling it's almost this like academic curiosity on his part. Mm. Like, is it? what fear does to people really fascinating. Well, he, he, he brings up like Jungian archetypes at some point. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's clearly like a very smart guy. Who's just kind of in a sick way, enjoying like studying, like screwing he's like up a people. trickster. Yeah. Basically mm. where, where he's like messing with all the things, but not doesn't necessarily have morals, a specific yeah. malice that he's pursuing. He's right. more of a Loki character. So we like him a little bit more. Right. He's more low key, Loki. <laughs> I was just, <laughs> Brian wasn't going for it, so I my brain went there and was like, "That's low even for me." And then <laughs> you went there. One last thing I want to mention is I one thing I love about this movie is that before filming started, Christopher Nolan had the whole crew sit down and watch Blade Runner. Yes, as like yeah, an yeah, aesthetic yeah. inspiration to the movie, and you even have Rutger Hauer in the movie, which is interesting. But I, I just I love that as a concept to say, you know. A lot of people, when they make a movie and a franchise, their their inspiration is the other movies in the franchise. Mm-hmm. And it just becomes this like cyclical kind of thing. Just like Spider-Man Homecoming was, what if we made a Spider-Man movie that's actually a John Hughes 80s like high school comedy? You know, this was sort of what if we made a sort of Blade Runner-esque Batman movie. And I love that as an inspiration. And then he also drew from Richard Donner's Superman mm-hmm. in the sense of like, let's spend some real time with the cast. Like let's, first of all, let's cast like real actors, you know, Morgan Freeman, Mm -hmm. Michael Caine, uh, uh, Gary Oldman, you know, like, like real heavy hitters and then have 
them play real characters who are dealing with real situations mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. And I think that like, cause Richard Donner Superman is one of those comic movies from pre golden age of comic book movies. That's like, Oh no, but that actually holds up other than, you know, he flies around the world and it goes backwards. But other than that, <laughs> I was um, gonna say. <laughs> yeah. um, but you are, you do, you do have more just spending more time with the characters as real people. And then, and then I just also love taking inspiration from like the Frank Miller comics and the more adult comic series, rather than trying to make this family friendly kind of, right. you know, I'll get drive through <laughs> Batman and Robin type thing, because people always talk about like, Oh, it's the origin of this character. Like it's the original character. And it's like, when it's Batman, it's been decades and decades of everything. People will find plenty of comics where he kills and plenty of comics where he's yeah. not like gritty and that kind of thing that it's not about like necessarily what came first. It's a, it's about finding the thing that feels the most um, sort of most relevant to, I think the movie that you are trying to make. And I think if you're trying to make a, a silly movie that's fine you know you can make lego batman like there's nothing wrong with that but um but i also think it's about like kind of finding that tone that you want and then just sticking with that and not trying to veer too far outside of it i think part of the reason that the corny stuff in this movie feels corny is because the rest of the movie is so focused and dark and sort of serious that like when it kind of veers away from that it feels like a huge veer whereas if that kind of thing happened in thor ragnarok it would feel completely normal or it would right. feel like okay yeah that's that's what this movie is i was struck watching it again how much they emphasize the fear of like the goons that batman is pursuing like in the mid- midpoint of the film when there's that like container yeah uh, mm-hmm. storage area scene where are you Here. yeah yeah <laughs> it's kind of like it's it the way it's structured is like a thriller slasher movie you know it, mm-hmm. it's like he, like we're with the henchman right and batman is like the specter like scary thing and that was that's an interesting choice to to not have us with batman in some of those scenes but we're seeing the effect he's having as he creates fear in his enemies and and the whole movie has kind of like a has a lot of horror elements in it you know from the for sure some of the mm-hmm. like uh you know the psychotropic hallucination things are pretty horrific and it it just goes to places that yeah, they're, they're not normal superhero places to go. They're usually more in like dark psychological thriller or horror. That's also something that was really interesting and refreshing and cool seeing it back in 2005 was like, wow, that was like kind of like a dark M. Night Shyamalan. I mean, that, that was back when he was still exciting. <laughs> but, you know, that was like, well, that was like a that was like a dark <laughs> uh it was a it was a dark like thriller experience as yeah. well as a superhero movie, which mm-hmm. was was also tickled 2005 Alex quite a bit. Yeah. One thing that I think is really smart about this movie and all of the Batman movies, actually, is that they are wisely scaled. They are about Gotham. There mm, is no. Yes. There's no other than like we end up over in that resurrection pit prison thing uh, a decent number of times too many times i think (laughs) but the movies are always about gotham and it's really interesting the films exist in a place of interesting conversation um obviously gotham functions narratively as a microcosm for society in general society in urban settings in general but the movies are always in a really interesting conversation just the batman story is involved in what is the responsibility of the individual to one's immediate social system mm. and so i think that that's and and the movie grapples with this like we've talked about the theme of fear but it really grapples with the theme of inaction and justice, right? And so, like, I'm struck by what Rachel said in the says in the car to Bruce at the beginning. What chance does Gotham have when good people do nothing? And so there's something there in I feel like that is kind of at the core of Bruce's journey in this. And she names the city. She says the city by name. And, and they say it so much in the Batman movies. Like, Every single Batman movie is like, but what about Gotham? Mm -hmm. And that is the local, political, social community. Economic. Economic that these people are living in. And it's really interesting that Batman villains, the really evil ones are like, I will destroy Gotham. 
right? Or in some way, I will tear out the trust of the people of Gotham that they have in their community. That's like what a Batman villain wants to do. It's fascinating. Like this idea that I can make people of Gotham turn on each other. I can make neighbors hate each other. I can make them distrust their elected officials. I can destroy the fabric of this social system. And what is the responsibility of the individual as a part of that social system is what Batman is about. And that is cool. <laughs> like, that is a cool question yeah. for a superhero movie to be asking. Because so often our heroes concern themselves with quote unquote bigger problems or like larger ideological problems. And I'm not saying that Batman isn't about that as well. Um, there are these sort of like, and of course, individual like, you know, emotional journeys or, or, or philosophical journeys. Those are always in there as well. But always framed in the sense of, but what do I do about my neighbors or the poor in my community? What do I do with the wealth that I've inherited? What is the real legacy of coming from a place of privilege as a member of a society? That is why I think that people are really fascinated by the world of Batman. It's so much more relatable in that like social uh, storytelling kind of way. And it lets it be allegorical. Like it doesn't, we don't, mm -hmm. if it was set in New York City, we would have feelings about the real politics of New York City. But right. Because it's a fictional city that stands in for any metropolis, maybe one more than others, but it lets us access it and think about it in more abstract terms that let us focus on that, that morality and the bigger questions rather than being distracted by our own personal politics or whatever it might be, might be in the way there. And I'll just add, it also means that the stakes of each conflict like are real stakes because right. you can imagine Gotham falling apart it's hard to imagine how this franchise will go on if the entire world blows up, you know? So mm. that that's always interesting in a superhero movie when it's like the bad thing could actually happen and like Batman could still be a thing, you know, <laughs> like that yeah. raises the stakes quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when the Spider-Man movies are at their best too, because that is set in New York, but, right, but when, similar. but this idea of your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, this idea that this is a person who is a part of your own community and really invested in the place where he lives. Spider-Man's kind of asking that exact question, like, and Peter Parker's always wondering that same thing. What's my responsibility to the people immediately around me? And maybe that's why these Spider-Man and Batman are the two most rebooted characters, maybe. Mm. it seems. Like, they they really seem to have some staying power. And the last thing I was going to say is that I, I think the most, you know, talking about the the theme of, fear the most fearful part of the movie i think that that the movie does for the audience is when it introduces surprise joffrey baratheon oh yeah i think that is <laughs> <laughs> i thought about that i'm like why, why are we most, trying to save this kid yeah the most horrifying right that's the one mistake batman makes <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we go around and say what lessons we're going to take from Batman Begins. Alex, would you like to start us off? So one thing I, I was listening to a podcast just today, um, Russell Brand's podcast, Under the Skin, and he's talking to this guy who kind of is an expert or kind of trying to carry on the tradition of like indigenous mythological storytelling mm. and like and and the kind of kind of Jungian hero's journey archetypes of like initiation in indigenous cultures where it's oh. like, you know, there's 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 this you know there's a kind of a male and a female version of it of like a lot of indigenous cultures you go off by yourself and kind of go into like this kind of extreme survival situation to kind of find yourself and face your fears and then come back to the tribe kind of like now as an adult now with new wisdom from that like journey and there's something that is deeply like resonant about that and really true about that and i was struck by how much batman begins leans on that yeah kind of archetypal journey i mean bruce wayne literally goes out into the world with nothing almost starves like ends up in a prison and then kind of builds himself back up out of that through his training with Ra's al Ghul, whatever Liam Neeson there's something that is very resonant about that journey and part of why I really enjoy the first half of this movie like I'm kind of okay with it not being a Batman movie for a while because I really buy that uh, transformation of Bruce Wayne because they show us the whole thing mm -hmm. uh, so yeah so I, I, I really appreciate the way 
they very consciously lean into these deep archetypal things about transformation about the human experience that have been with us for thousands of years um and i think it's it's really cool the, the movie because it doesn't take place in gotham for a lot of the first half kind of it doesn't feel like a superhero movie it feels like this more mythic thing out in the glaciers out in the mountains mm -hmm. yeah absolutely brian yeah you know it's funny because we talked about this plenty but this sort of that slow first act where we do have a lot of time spent with Bruce out kind of meandering, even if it's slow, I do appreciate when a movie takes the time to sell me on its concept, whether it's Jurassic Park or The Exorcist or The Shining, or like any like mm -hmm. horror or like comic book movie, anytime it's sort of this high concept, there's something non-normal happening here. I appreciate when that movie takes time to get me to earn that thing. And I think in the case of Batman Begins, it's specifically the protagonist's motivations that have to be earned, which is, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. this is a gritty crime drama where a guy dresses up like a bat. It's not a fun, silly popcorn movie where a guy dresses up like a bat. It's a, it's this gritty crime, like mobster, you know, uh, samurai whatever it's trying to be and i think that i like i just i love that nolan insisted on spending a lot of time with bruce wayne such that when he becomes batman and when i say becomes batman he chooses to become batman unlike the magical superheroes who get bitten right. by a spider or like end up becoming mm -hmm. a superhero mm -hmm. whether they want to or not mm -hmm. batman says no i am going to make this choice to dress like a bat and say i'm batman at people you know and and do <laughs> <laughs> and do a weird voice, you know. Um, I also do that. Hey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you just sell this concept of like, oh, I have to become something more than a man. That's how you become an idea or a legend. Yeah. Uh, compassion is what separates us from them. That's why I don't kill. That's why I have this rule, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and whether or not this is the best example of it, you know, I'm not making that argument. I'm just saying that I really do appreciate. Yeah. It's, it's why we do like the origin story is because we get from normal person normal as bruce wayne can be you know normal ish person to this other thing whereas sequels are always okay this person's already a superhero so now what do we do and there are lots of good answers to that question lots of bad answers to that question but i do appreciate anytime a movie takes this amount of time to really make me believe why a character would choose to do something like this and it's really i mean going off of both your point and alex's point it's choosing to do those things leans on what like a superhero story is like supposed to be like mm -hmm. i don't know it, it's just it's utilizing this this kind of story and myth that we have to its fullest potential yes in a in a way that's cool and kind of got lost before it and maybe at, like for a while after afterwards it's gotten murkier but i feel like when when those superhero stories are made clear they are the modern myths with all the archetypes and getting at these big moral ideas and in, in epic, fun, uh, but affecting ways. And Batman Begins is, is very good at doing that, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. yeah. Trisha? Um, I have a lot of, I was going to say complaints, but that's not the word that I mean. <laughs> I have a lot of uh, <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts about the character design of Rachel Dawes. Since she is a completely original character for this trilogy, and she is a really important part of this trilogy. I think that it's, she's not utilized um, as well as she could be, but the actual design of her character is really, really smart. So I really love that she comes from, like her mother is a domestic servant in the Wayne household. So she and Bruce know each other from childhood. That's super important to this mm -hmm. character. Um, She has to be able to break through Bruce Wayne's facade mm -hmm. in a way that people that know him as an adult simply can't do. And so it is really effective, effective shortcut to get like straight to the heart of who Bruce, Bruce Wayne is and allow her to speak straight to the heart of who he is. Mm -hmm. um, I also really love, there's a lot of things I love about her. She's smart is another one of them. Um, she's really motivated. She comes from, you know, a, a, her mother's a domestic servant and yet she puts herself through law school and like becomes the, the DA, you know, the ADA. Um, there's a lot of really cool stuff about her as a character. But what I really like is that she is also fighting crime in Gotham. 
and right. Right. she fundamentally disagrees with everything about the way Bruce is doing it. I think both of those things make her a really cool foil for him. And the scene where, again, I, that's the it's the one that I was talking about when she asks, what chance does Gotham have when good people do nothing? That scene is really compelling because they're tossing back and forth these like ideological approaches to when you see there's something wrong with your city, what do you do about it? And she's like, you're doing it the wrong way. And she, at the end, says that his dad would be proud of him. I don't think she believes that. I think that, again, they didn't, <laughs> they, they didn't follow, they embedded her with all this cool stuff and didn't follow it all the way to its logical conclusions or its logical implications. I also think all of this makes her not a great love interest for Bruce but a really, really good foil for him um, because she is there to provide a counterpoint to this rich thematic argument. And it allows her, as you were saying, Michael, to have her own subplot where she is doing something that brings her, happens to bring her into the crosshairs of one of the villains. But it's because she's fighting crime in Gotham in her own way. It's not a surprise that she would run into one of the villains. Does she end up being a damsel in distress? Yes. But the... Motivation of nipples. for oh my god, <laughs> I can't with all of it. Um, but the but the way that she lands there is properly motivated in her character. There's a lot of really good character work there, actually, just in terms of her design. So there are definitely some lessons to be taken from that. And the biggest one of which is have somebody that's not on the hero side, but there to she kind of is, but mostly there to just really challenge the way he's doing things. Right. And and I think that's that's such an important part of him becoming who he is, is yeah. like not being allowed to be fundamentalist in this like one like ideology that he has, but running up against this person that he cares a lot that makes extremely good points and is also right. And you need to listen to her. And somewhere in, in that push and pull is is where you're like things are supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. I really like Rachel. I, I also wish she was in it more and kind of didn't disintegrate a little bit in mm-hmm. the second half. Of the film. Well, and I feel like she's she provides the like origin for his no kill rule, basically, in that yep. scene in the car mm-hmm. where he throws the gun away. Oh, it's very clear she that slaps that him. Came from yeah. Her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love. I mean, I think that's yeah. a yeah. really cool decision. She's the only person who really hits him and gets away with it. Um, but <laughs> but I, I mean, I love that moment. It's just that moment feels very raw and very yes. mm-hmm. and very clear without really having dialogue. It's like she sees the gun and then she just smacks him and she's pissed off. And it's good. She hits him twice. Everything. Yeah, I love that she hits him. twice Yeah, exactly. Too. She could have yeah. just hit him one time and it would have been like, oh, that was a thing that happened. Right. She meant it. Yeah. She wanted him to know that she meant it. Shame I have not communicated you. what I'm saying enough. <laughs> I only one time in my life smacked someone in the face because I really disagreed with them and, and thought they needed to be smacked in the face. And I, I didn't hit them as hard as I wish I had. Um, but because I, because that impulse. I'm glad like, we I, have I, our meetings over Zoom. <laughs> this yeah. is Trisha's oh, lesson. <laughs> I, I'm just saying it's like, I wonder if that was a direction from Nolan or if that was just Katie Holmes going like, he didn't feel it the first time. I got to hit him again. Um, I mean, it was Christian Bale. Was it- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think it's, there's a lot, there's a lot to like about Rachel. We'll n- yeah. tune in for the next episode where right. I bring up all of the other stuff about Rachel, but yeah. there's a lot to like here. Rachel part yeah. two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah my, my lesson is just kind of a filmmaking lesson of appreciating in a way that sometimes I don't. Christopher Nolan's commitment to making it a grounded reality, and so much of that was in we want to go to real locations and film in actual places because you can feel the difference. And sometimes I'm like, well, I feel like that's a little bit of just like, I want to be an auteur and I'm going to make a decision that makes life harder for everyone. (laughs) But I think this is a clear example of where it makes a huge difference. And I mean, it's in the casting, as you were talking about, Brian, but I think because there's this this crystal clear comparison between Batman Begins and The Dark Knight and, you know, the Joel Schumacher and Tim Burton Batman films, kind of marching orders for Batman Begins was we don't want this to feel like it was shot on the Warner Brothers back lot. Mm-hmm. Right. And all the other Batmans completely feel like that. It doesn't Absolutely. feel like a real world right. whatsoever. Mm. They built sets. Yeah. Yeah. And so I feel like this is just a, a very stark contrast to that, to show what that commitment to going to these crazy places can do for something, especially when you're trying to reboot and realign and make people think about something differently, that these stylistic choices have a, a very profound and measurable effect, I feel like, in, in Batman Begins specifically. 
And we will talk about Michael Caine. Like, right. sorry, we, we haven't we got, mentioned We got two more yet, movies. Yeah. Got two yeah. more movies to go. Hang in there with us. We'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> you can take so the rose out if you like, Mr. White. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Great. Well, why don't we talk about what we have been watching recently? Trisha, you want to start us off? Sure. So I decided to watch The Atomic Cafe, which is a 1982 documentary that is actually a compilation of footage from U.S. propaganda films about the atomic bomb Mm. and uh, mostly about why the atomic bomb was not a threat to U.S. citizens. Um, So the the propaganda films were made in, in the 50s, obviously. And then the Atomic Cafe, which is sort of just cut together footage from these propaganda movies uh, was released in 1982. It has an amazing soundtrack of like pop music about the bomb, um, which is wild. Like I'd never heard any of it before. Uh, Lots of really interesting songs that people were writing about nuclear war at the time. I know all of them from the Fallout games. (laughs) (laughs) We're going nuclear. All right, go ahead. But that is kind of how they sound. Um, Th- that is one. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but then anyway, I decided to make it a double feature after I finished watching that and watched Blast from the Past, uh, starring Brendan nice. Fraser and, Al- and Alicia wow. Silverstone nice. from 1999. Yes. You mean Blast? Wow. <laughs> That's a blast from the past now. <laughs> yeah, it is. It That's really kind of is. Yeah. The thing that I remember most from that movie was when they show his parents like how amazing technology is. They microwave oh, yeah. a slice of bread. <laughs> <laughs> they're like they put a slice of bread in their microwave and microwave nobody microwaves a slice of bread and Brendan Fraser's mom is like so amazed when she like touches it and it's hot his <laughs> parents are played by Christopher Walken and Sissy Spacek right. wow. this movie is Hold actually on. a real delight there's a lot of there's a lot of like the swing moment happening from yes. like the 90s yes. they're doing swing music and whatever It's and it's also just a really interesting you don't have to watch them back to back, but I just thought it was interesting because it's obviously Blast from the Past is drawing on what Americans thought about, you know, nuclear war and what the future was going to be uh, in the 50s. So anyway, sorry, what what was it, Bri? Well, you've got Batwoman and Max Shrek from Batman Returns. So mm-hmm. it ties in nicely. It pairs nicely with Batman Begins. Also, Brendan Fraser's character's name is Adam and Alicia Silverstone's character's name is Eve. It's really oh, okay. dark. That's, that's dark. <laughs> yeah, that's a dark choice there. Yeah. Ava. We apologize for everything. <laughs> I do feel like Trisha just like types into a random word generator when we ask her what movie and then she makes up what that movie is. She's like, <laughs> right. I, I watched Cafe. I watched <laughs> Verdant Meal, the 1963 uh, <laughs> I, I pull them all from Taylor Swift lyrics, actually. <laughs> uh, okay, Brian, what have you been watching? Uh, I watched the Netflix documentary Disclosure, which my friend yeah. Jenny, Jenny Denton was the key grip on. So shout out to her. Um, but it's uh, the Laverne Cox produced um, documentary about trans representation in Hollywood over like literally as far back as the first movies that have ever existed. Um, hmm. And... It's it's sort of a a journey through movies and or film I should say um, over the last hundred years, but featuring interviews from these trans women and men uh, who are mostly actors or writers or producers or directors and and it's sort of showing the this you know history of trans characters historically having been serial killers or prostitutes or the crazy person Mm -hmm. or it's just a guy who has to dress up like a woman and that's hilarious uh because of course it is kind of thing and you know it's interesting because it's not necessarily it's not saying like mrs doubtfire is evil or anything like that (laughs) it's just saying like when you look at here's all of the representation there was or 95 percent of the representation there was Mm -hmm. it's a common thread of well of course trans people aren't going to be taken seriously because this is all there is and sort of right. consistently and repeatedly. But then the nice thing is it also shows the last 10 ish years of representation in Hollywood and how it is start starting to turn. And you do have characters who are just a character in a movie and their, their transness isn't important to their character. They just exist. Like um, I noticed it in the season three of Jessica Jones, the receptionist she hires. Um, it's just, it's just a, 
trans woman and that's fine like there is no like well and i had to make the choice to do this because it. it's like nope mm -hmm. there, we don't have to mention it it's just there these people exist and they should be loved and represented and in things and uh yeah so it's it's a really it's a really cool watch yeah very cool alex i have been watching season two of homecoming on amazon prime Mm. Uh, and I watched, I loved the first season. It was uh, directed entirely by Sam Esmail, who created Mr. Robot. And it was, uh, starts Julie Roberts in season one. And it's just a really fun kind of Hitchcockian, crazy, twisty ride that's uh, in half hour chunks, uh, which is really enjoyable. Um, and the first season's a complete story. So it didn't, didn't really need to come back, but they've created a season two, uh, starring Janelle Monet. And mm -hmm. I was pretty skeptical because Sam Ismail's not back to direct. So I'm like, ah, is it going to be the same? But they've carried on with this real commitment to this like neo Hitchcock uh, style, which is really enjoyable, uh, really fun score, really fun cinematography, and just a really classic, like kind of a mystery box story, but done in a more old timey way, if that makes sense, where the reveals don't feel like lost they feel like a hitchcock reveal um and it's once again in half hour chunks so it's just kind of an easy enjoyable watch uh so i'd recommend it it's really fun i've been meaning to check this out so now i need i definitely need to do this yeah so i've been listening to a podcast season five of revisionist history by Malcolm nice. gladwell I am a huge Malcolm gladwell fan i feel like i've probably talked about it before you have okay did I talk about his book or the podcast? Doesn't the matter book. today. Okay. Because yes. the book is great. And I also re listened to that while doing motion graphics recently. Um, but season five of his podcast, Revisionist History, is out. And what I love about his approach to things is I feel like the subtitle for every Malcolm Gladwell thing could basically be here's why human common sense is usually wrong and why we shouldn't <laughs> listen to it. Uh, and I, it just provides a, a perspective i think to have in life and this season has been interesting because there's been a lot more multi-episode chunks where like, earlier seasons each one was about a, a different subject this season there's been like seven or eight episodes and it's been about three subjects maybe four now but yeah i just i highly recommend it because it's it's very fun and easy to listen to but it's very enlightening and it makes you look at things from a different perspective which I think is always good. And they kind of are also always low key about social issues happening right now. And so the episodes this this season have touched on like the things we value and how we assign money to things. And is mm. that the best way to value things? There's a very fascinating one about we say this is what democracy in its idealized form should be doing. Here's this other form of democracy that feels super unfair, but has been shown to actually be more fair and achieve the goal that we say we want democracy to do, but it doesn't feel as free. So like, what does that mean? And then there's a really interesting uh, four part series on World War Two, kind of <laughs> since you were just talking about the bomb church, it's kind of talking about that same period. Very interesting. But why uh, we we all know about the atomic bomb, but we don't know much about the development of napalm and how that was employed mm. against the Japanese and how horrific all of that was. And Correct. so, yeah, anyway, it's just it's it's this perfect blend for me anyway of very enjoyable, but also very enlightening and kind of unsettling in a way that I find useful. So revisionist history season five. Awesome. Nice. Okay, well, this has been our first episode of three on the Dark Knight trilogy, talking about Batman Begins. Next episode, we will, of course, be talking about the Dark Knight. Patrons, you are currently voting, and we'll probably have finished by the time this comes out, on what Nolan patron-exclusive episode we're going to do. We're very excited to talk about another non-Batman Christopher Nolan film for you guys. Uh, and also, I just wanted to shout out our editor, Eric. Yay. You are amazing. We, we never talk about you. Eric! We love you. Eric Schneider, you're amazing. He makes us sound good or less bad, whatever the case may be. Thanks, Eric. Eric, don't don't edit this part out. <laughs> so much smarter than we actually sound. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And we will see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.